Nun ist es meine besondere Freude, I'm very pleased to introduce one of the most well-known representatives in Germany, Gertz Werner. He is one of the most important people who has fought for basic income. And he is also the founder of the Unternehm die Zukunft movement, Venture the Future. And the title of his presentation is The Idea of Unconventional Basic Income, a Copernican Turn. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, dear friends, dear colleagues. And it's at a conference, it's always hard for the person who's the last to take the floor. I think a good bit of my time has already been used up. So how much of your lunch break can I take away from you? So I would like to ask for your understanding. I will try to speed up. We've, we know all about basic income, and it's important nonetheless to have such a conference. There are not enough people here based on how dramatic this whole question is. I think we'd have to fill the Munich Soccer Stadium instead. But as I said, we have to start with a small beginning, and only a small amount of yeast will allow you to have your cake or bread rise. So pathways to basic income. The pathway is always in your mind and in your heart. That is the question that we have to ask. And over the last five years, I've given more than 100 presentations. I've got some experience there. And we cannot convince people. The people have to be convinced themselves. You can only be convinced if you take a look at yourselves. You have to think first and then feel the situation. Thinking alone will not suffice because thinking leads you towards inhumane ideologies. But if you can feel something, then we can take on initiatives. We have to think about the idea of unconditional basic income and make it something that we believe in. We have to live with this idea. We have to live with this idea in society and discuss this in society. We have to take on initiatives. Initiatives always come from our hearts, not from our minds. They try it again and again, but they're not usually successful. And if something is successful, then it usually leads to something which is inhumane, if it comes from the head. That's why we begin with thinking, and that's why we need such a conference. So let's talk about the question, basic income. Let's then go out to the outside world. It's sort of like a big event and pass this message on to the rest of the world, the idea of unconditional basic income. Anything that changes society is, has its roots in culture. It's always a cultural question. That's why we have to begin with the cultural poll. We also have a prologue to Faust, and this is a lovely episode, which is described by Goethe, where Mephisto goes to God and challenges God. And he challenges God and says to him, well, give me one of your people so that I can show you how they can all be corrupted and manipulated. And then he said, God said to him, okay, well, take Dr. Faust. And then the famous sentence, he says, but stand to the side, this is quoting from Goethe, if you realize that the human being is aware of all of his dark sides. All I can say is think of this 
quote, it's true, if someone says to you that you are a good guy. Well, that's what people say to me all the time as well. We are not. We mean we have good intentions, and that is the whole idea between behind the idea of a basic income, being do-gooders. People are born, and when they are born, and some of you have gone through this as well, and then you have to grow, and you have to talk about a just economic and political system. Will we create the right framework conditions so that every individual can be involved in society with their personal ambitions, initiatives? Can they bring these to society and express them in society? And this is the possibility for working on the social structure of our society and changing it. Then we have the climax in Faust, and this is the bet that takes place between Mephistus and Dr. Faust, where Faust says to Mephistus, if I say this moment should stay as it is, you're so beautiful, then put me in chains and I'd be happy to be destroyed. I think that this is a huge challenge for every one of us. And everyone can say, how often have I lost such a bet? And if you think about how often you've lost the bet, then it's easier to observe this in others than in yourself. This is an experience you've made again and again. The older you get, and then you will see that in society, this is this Mephisto's perseverance. He wants to hold on to this one single beautiful moment in our lives, which prevents us from helping to further develop society. You'll see that again and again in ourselves. It's most difficult to see it in yourselves. We suffer this in our marriage. We also observe this in companies. And we also see this all over the world, this perseverance. And when we're talking about unconditional basic income, then we have to take a new look at things. And what's interesting here is that many people are afraid of dealing with new things. You can see that very clearly. In Bavaria, a very important entrepreneur here, and I've been their customer for about 40 years now, the largest customer, and this is someone who works a lot with art, you know them all. You all know him, and he's involved in social problems. He suffers with all these problems. But he is not willing to even think about unconditional basic income, not even for his best customer. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Well, that would have been a clever move on his part. What does he say? Well, basic in income, that's ridiculous, he says. Or the Bavarians would say, we won't even go to the trouble of ignoring it. That is our mandate. Dear friends, that is our mandate. And this is a question of your social intuition, your imagination, each and every one of us. How can we 
manage to communicate and be productive with one another? How can we manage to make the others willing to receive this message? The idea of considering unconditional basic income. If we don't manage that, then there will be no changes. We have to have enough people in our society who begin to want to think about this idea, who want to begin to identify it with it, to see it as a possible prospect for development in our society. They have to include this in their imagination. And when we manage that, or if we manage that, if we arrive at a critical I can't come up with a better word, but this critical mass of people, if we can find these critical mass, it doesn't have to be everybody, but if we have the critical mass, who will consider the question of what society do we want to live in? What do we have to change so that we will have a future? If these people are open to this question, these are questions where the results are still not known. But if this becomes a trend, then things will change. It's not all that difficult to give information to people and show them where they can observe all of this. And at this point, I'd like to quote Albert Einstein. He said, today's problems cannot be solved if we think, use the same way of thinking which caused these problems to come up in the first place. We can see that again and again, everywhere. It's people who are on unemployment, the people who discovered the new Hearts for Unemployment scheme. They said we have to do something to cause society to explode. No, they had good intentions. That was their way of thinking. And they really thought that they had come up with the ideal solution. And they still think they did. They think they did, but they're wrong. They claim that it was a great thing. They're proud of it. That's amazing. Makes me sick, but it's unreal. A lot of people think that it's a great achievement. The media, the journalists, they are the most reactionary of all. That's the experience I've had with them. It's a real challenge to talk to them, but the media are reactionary. Read in the press, no matter what you read. There are only a few exceptions. We have to change that, and we will only manage to do that if people who have to take all these different points into account. They have to be able to think in terms of these changes. And my method is, well, there are two very important points that we can consider in our evolution, and you can prove this very easily, and that is change, the change in our existential existence. These are the turning points. Maybe 200 years. That's not very long in the terms of the history of mankind. And self-sufficiency, when we move from an agricultural society, self-sufficiency, where the individual and his family had to get whatever they needed from the land they had. That was the situation which existed for centuries. We have to really think about that. What does that mean? They live in their family. You have a piece of land, a plot of land, and you farm this land. 
and everything that you harvest is for you. So we are working for ourselves. That's what has been the situation for millennia. You remember. Think about it. And this all changed quite quickly. It changed to a situation, and today, or at least since, well, since World War II, let's say, 60 or 70 years ago, you could say, there is nobody left who is truly self-sufficient, objectively speaking. But if you ask people, they still think that they live off their income. But have you ever seen anyone who can live for off their income? They think that in their old age they will live off what they've saved. That is a mistake. We have to enlighten the people on this. I tell people, if you want to prepare for old age, do what I do. Have seven kids and give them good education. Then you can expect that maybe two or three of them might be able to take care of you later on. This is the actuarial effect. That's the question. We have to make this accessible to people. These are truisms, and people still feel good. I'm doing something for myself. I'm a hard worker. Pol politicians even say that. They say people have to be hard working. What does that mean, to work hard? Do they have to save? Do they have to spend their money? The money that threatens all of us in the financial crisis are not the money from people that have too much money. That's our savings that we want to get a maximum interest rate on. And that's what's being destroyed. You can read all about it everywhere. It's the funds, the insurance policies, etc. This is a sort of we have a sort of addiction. We have to look and make provisions for our future, for our old age. In this Mephisto-like situation, we're cutting off the possibilities for young people to become involved in our society. We are the ones. It's not the bankers. Those are just some results of all of this, they have a difficult position, but that's not our problem. God will look after them. No, no. The reason we are the cause of all of this, if I just look in this room, if I could count which each and every individual of you has set aside health insurance, Old age insurance, life insurance, car insurance, you'd be amazed at the totals that we'd come up with. And with all of this money, these values, and that's what's a real threat to us. Why? Because we have eliminated the agreement between the generations in our minds. And this means that we believe that we have to uh, make provisions for our own old age. 200 or 300 years ago, nobody even thought about that. It was not possible. Every year you had Thanksgiving, and you hoped that next year you'd have enough as well. Now, basic income... And I notice this again and again. People are willing to listen. And this is where people open up. This means reestablishing an agreement between the different generations. With a basic income, everyone lives off what society produces month by month. One person will also be productive. So this is the essence of basic income. So this change from self-sufficiency to being provided for by others, that's quite demanding. It's demanding. 
And it has nothing to do with education or individual economic situation. It's a question here of where you meet up with the original views of mankind. And for us, this is indeed a Copernican turn. That's why we have this picture here. This is made in wood, and this is the title of our book. It means that people are taken to their original soul, and this is something that needs to be called into question. Now, to tell somebody in Bavaria that they shouldn't vote the Conservative Party anymore, the CSU here in Bavaria, but that's even more difficult. Now, I think what we have here and something that has always been recognized is to call something into question. It's like uh, really taking everything away from them. This is the Copernican turn. The Copernican turn, we all know, was in the 15th century. And until people had accepted this, until people began to recognize this and to say, right, no, the earth is not flat. The earth is not the center of the universe. The earth rotates. It's round. It took centuries. It wasn't until 1845, I think, that Copernicans writings were included. It was in, not until 1865 that it was proven that the Earth rotated. Not, everybody believed it. So, it's not a question here. And I say this again and again when people call for experiments. It's not a question of having proof of unconditional basic income. It's a question of having an internal experience for people to say, yes, that is correct, because I can observe it. And because that's the, I feel that it's right, I myself. And that's the second Copernican turn, which is also very, very difficult. Try it out yourselves, wherever you are. This is your homework, wherever you are. Try to find creative areas. Try to find out where you can uh, introduce conditional, unconditional basic income in a discussion, a conversation at your 20th school reunion, do it and you will be happy that you've done so. And people will be happy. They'll say, right, that's, that was a very interesting evening. And you'll see what kind of views people have. It's quite surprising. But only in this way will we make progress. And my second point, and this is based on my experience, and this is how we arrive at unconditional basic income. As an entrepreneur, I was lucky. I was successful. And success as an entrepreneur means that you need other people to help you to deal with your success. You need to hire employees. The number depends on how great your success is. So that's what I did. And the mayor told us so much about Otto Brun. It's all very interesting, but one thing is lacking, and you don't have the DM drugstore chain in your town. Well, there is. there are three in Unterhaching, which is right down the road. So... Hundreds of interviews. I was still young. I conducted hundreds of interviews. I learned a lot. Interviews for future employees. 
Imagine, interviews means that you have to be interested in the applicant's CV. This was great training for me. You might have four or five such interviews every day, day in and day out, and you always have to be interested in somebody else's biography. And it took a long time, I must say, but at some point in time, even the stupidest of the stupid will notice, the applicant cannot begin to work for me until it's clear what her salary will be. I learned that fairly quickly, but one thing I didn't learn very quickly was what effect it would have on my thinking, and then it became clear to me. In my company, I said, the people who work in my company, we now have more than 40,000, they don't get paid their income because they work for us. And here is the turning point, not because they work for us. That's what eight or nine hundred would say, but they get it because they can afford to work for us. And this change means that you get a whole different image of our society. Work is not there to generate income, as it is seen today. Work is possible only if I have an income. And this is what we have at the end of the day, is now at the very beginning. And it's the same in your personal lives. The income you earn allows you to pay for the next month and the months to follow. So this change, it sounds harmless. In other words, income is not payment for your work, but income is the possibility to work. If you manage to get this message across to more and more people, and to make it part of their way of thinking, then you can hope that people will then really be aware of what the right thing to do is. An individual can learn for himself. But I, as I said, I've had, it took me so many interviews before I finally got it. And then I was aware of the fact that work and income have to be separated. And work is never affordable. And then it becomes very clear. And anthroposophic attitudes have made this clear to me. I need income to live. That's obvious. That can be proven very easily. I need my income to live. Well, what do you need the work for, then, you might ask? Well, that's easy, then. I don't need my, my workers, my employees anymore. It seems there are some well-minded trained unionists who talk about basic income. And think about the spirit when they talk about a set-aside premium. That's how far we've come. So if I have income, if I need income so that I can leave a modest life, that's the definition for basic income, so that I can have a modest but dignified life within the meaning of Article 1, not 245, of our Constitution, human dignity is inalienable. That is the criterion. It's all very simple. You have to ask that question again and again. Can someone live a dignified life and without having his dignity be alienated, either by his boss, his mother-in-law, his wife, etc.? In other words, human dignity is an inalienable right. That is the idea behind basic income. And that, what does that generate? Freedom. It doesn't generate freedom, of course. It generates a space for freedom. 
It's important to mention that because freedom, you can't buy that in the supermarket and certainly not at the DM drugstore. So think about coming to Otto Brunn. But freedom is something that you have to fight for yourself. Freedom means having the guts to say no. And if I say no, I'm going to go my own way. Don't be corrupted or tempted or paid or tempted by incentives or bonus or whatever. This will not make you happy. You have to go your own way based on your personal ideas. Take, you have to be independent. I have to be independent in material terms. In the past, and all socialist movements resulted from this, in the past, the free man and that means the free man, a man is free in the period of self-sufficiency. If he had property, the question of the powerful people, people who wanted to be empowered, and they then fought for their property. In other words, they were conflicts when it came to property. That's why hundreds of thousands of British and Irish emigrated to the United States because of conflicts over their land. Now, today, if you want to suppress someone, if you want to really suppress someone, then you call his income into question, you threaten dismissal, you threaten termination, you threaten that he will lose his job, and not as directly as I've just said it, but in more subtle terms. Or you could give him a limited contract, or you could threaten him with minimum wage. So you have to be really careful when we talk about minimum wage. That's our problem, and that's what we have to liberate everyone from. So you have basic income that you cannot take anyone away from anyone, from cradle to coffin. This is what we have to connect, co to, connect to emotionally. This is what we have to convince people of. We need to find more people to keep this flame burning. So freedom, equality, love instead of fraternity. Then we will have achieved a lot. Of course, the pathways are still important, and I'm happy to contribute. But if we are unable to really take on our past, the traditions we love, the paradigms which nobody dares to challenge, or too few are daring to challenge. So if we can widen our horizon in this context, then I think unconditional basic income will spread. The idea will be disseminated. I'm very optimistic about it. We shouldn't make it an ideology. We shouldn't know better. We shouldn't try to to force people to be happy with this idea. Everyone has to find its own happiness. And the idea of basic income is an asymmetrical point. So think about unconditional basic income. What do you think about it? It's great. People will be interested in it. Think about your CV, your own CV. What course would your life have taken? And how could it go on if there was something like conditional basic income? So play with people, make people think about it. And then you will find out that many people will say, and uh, I say this from my own experience, then many people will say, well, then I can be hopeful again. This is what it's all about. We want to be hopeful again. And if we achieve this, 
dear fellow campaigners, well, then we are ready to knock on God's door. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, your lunch break will be reduced by 17 minutes. I would like to refer you to the result of six years of work. And um, it was published really at the same time as this Congress is now happening. It, it is a print by demand result, so to speak. You can buy it downstairs. There is a table. Um, you can buy it there from the ladies behind the table. It's not for free because everything that is produced by other people will have a fee. People will charge for it. So. If something is free, the term free is not really dignifying. You don't get it um, free of charge or for nothing. The Germans will know what I mean by this German term, umsonst. It's not a present, but you can buy it downstairs. So feel free to um, get one for yourself. Thank you. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, the interpreter is unable to understand the question. The speaker is not using a microphone. The answer is, well, I hope so. The question was, if I had ever asked myself how my, what my life would have been like with a basic income, if my parents had had one, for example, basic income. And I can say, probably my life would have been the same. I was lucky to grow up with money. My parents had money, and my mother always said, you don't talk about money, you just have it. We didn't have much, but we had enough. Therefore, I was able to fulfill my dreams and uh, accomplish what I always wanted in life. <laughs> 